Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, we're going to start this off with Cool in the Game. I think the greatest song they ever made and the greatest song of its time, Cherish. If you ain't heard it, but I know you have, here it is. Let's take a walk together. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go back in time. As you guys can see, this is the Credit River case. I've not heard anybody bring forth this point, but after giving the case some deliberations, looking at the Supreme Court decision, I want you all to pay attention to this particular case right here. It is very important that you pay attention to what was done in Credit River. And notice how this case applies to the entire United States. Shh, don't tell nobody. Lord have mercy. I would not have realized it if I had not paid attention. They've been lying to us all of these years. Let me show you something about this decree from the Justice Court of the State of Minnesota, County of Scott, Township of Credit River. Justice Mahoney, and we have National First Bank of Montgomery versus Jerome Daly. Judgment and decree. We're not going to read the whole thing. We're just going to read the top portion. The above entitled action. Let's do some. There we go. The above entitled action came before the court on July 12th, December 7th, 1968. Hmm. Nah, it was uh, about a year after that. I was uh, a couple of months after that when I was having my operation. Anyway, I had cut my hand. Anyway. At 10 a.m., the plaintiff appeared by its president, Lawrence V. Morgan, and was represented by its counsel, R. Melby. Defendant appeared on his own behalf because he was attorney. Anyway, now pay attention because we got some stuff to talk about. The plaintiff brought this as a common law action. Now, that's the most important thing of the whole case, and nobody pays attention to it. I've been noticing from the very first time this case was brought to my attention. Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention. It was a common law action. Okay, common law action. Hold on. Let's see. One second. Cherish the love. Cherish the life. Wake up. Seventh Amendment. Stop listening. Stop listening. I'm not going to be using it again, so might as well just shut it off since it wants to be stupid. Look, ladies and gentlemen, in suits at common law, this only applies to suits at common law. Technically, it doesn't. It applies to all suits. But I want you to want y'all to understand something. In suits at common law, where the value of the controversy exceeds, see, need a controversy. All suits were supposed. To, wait, hold on. Now, did you say that all suits were supposed to be a common law? There was no such thing as equitable courts in America. All suits were supposed to be at common law. Shh, don't tell nobody. That's why you don't see any other type of suit mentioned. What about that suit where the person is being prosecuted? They're being prosecuted for violating the law. It's a common law suit. The United States was under common law. What was the common law? Common law was the law of the colonies. Developed by the colonies. The so-called, pay attention, modified English common law. Now, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, modified English common law? That's correct. When the colonies were established here, they were here as a, for the most part, religious-based group of individuals. So they mixed in some of the laws, the good things of the law that they appreciated. And when they did this, they formed the laws of the territories, the laws of the colonists. 
And what they did is they weren't going to disrupt those colonists by giving them, throwing a bunch of other laws in their face. So they allowed each territory to keep its own respective laws so long as it didn't violate due process. Let us continue. The right to a trial by jury shall be preserved. Now, hold on. No fact tried by a jury, common law jury, shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of common law. Ladies and gentlemen, watch this. Credit River versus Daily. Oh, sorry. National Bank of Montgomery Daily. Stop listening. Ladies in my background is the Counting Crows. And they're they're singing somewhere wonderful under Wonderland. Somewhere under Wonderland. Anyway, let me show y'all this so that y'all get it. Some of y'all are going to pick it up in just a second. Let me uh, send them bye-bye. want y'all to pay attention. This is a judgment from the Supreme... Whoa, 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 hold on now. County of Scott, Justice of the Court. Oh, Justice Court. Okay, this is this is the ruling that we're looking at right now. Okay, I'm, I'm not concerned about that. I want the Supreme Court decision. Nah, we can't read that. That ain't going to work. I got to get another one because I can barely read that. Yeah, and you know this, what happens is, and they can't explain this phenomena, how when you copy something and 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 you copy something, then it degrades like this, even though it's still a copy of the original. It is a phenomenon that they cannot explain. They can try to explain it, but they can't explain it. So that's not the one I want. Hold on. There's going to be a lot of that. I think this is the one I want. No, that's the affidavit. I want the actual one that was actually the case. So give me a second. I'm looking for, this is the same one I just clicked on. I just needed to make sure. I thought that was it. I am looking for, when I opened up another page, it was the first one pulled up. I don't want scribbed. Don't want WordPress. Don't want any of that. I don't want scribbed again. National Bank. Don't want none of those websites. I want the Supreme Court decision. Lord have mercy. It's about time it took them that long. Well, you could have just put in Supreme. Look, don't tell me what I could have done. Shoot, your parents could have. Anyway, whew, almost took me there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Supreme Court. On July 11, 1969, Judge Justice Day Donald Peterson, acting for the Minnesota Supreme Court, directed Judge Mahoney, Justice of the Peace of the Crevert River Township, Scott County, Minnesota, and Jerome Daly, counsel for the plaintiff, in an action brought by one Leo Zong against whoever these people are. We don't care about all that. Pay attention. He says, to show cause why they should not permanently be restrained from any further proceedings in the justice court, why neither one of them should have any right to practice law. And pay attention. This Supreme Court justice ordered a stay of all further proceedings before the Justice of the Peace Court pending a final determination of the question raised by the Northwestern National Bank petition for writ of prohibition. Ladies and gentlemen, a writ of prohibition, <laughs> you can't overturn. Pay attention. You cannot overturn a common law decision via a writ of prohibition. A writ of prohibition is a civil action. Okay? Well, so it's the blah, 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 blah. No, you're not understanding. The Seventh Amendment makes it quite clear that no one, not even the Supreme Court of the United States can overturn 
a decision by a common law jury that they have concluded. Ain't that interesting? Mahoney and David Daly knew this. Mahoney and Daly both knew this to the point where Mahoney lost his life because of what he did, sticking to the Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, y'all need to understand this was a common lawsuit. The Supreme Court had no jurisdiction, nor can they explain away their jurisdiction. Okay, they don't have the right. Now, when you look at the when you look at the actual appeal that was done, when they finally got to the Supreme Court, there was nothing there saying that the jury had done anything wrong. The jury wasn't said to have been instructed wrong. It says the judge was wrong when he determined that the Federal Reserve was a fake, was violating the law. That's what they said. They didn't appreciate him attacking the Federal Reserve Bank, and of course they had to attack him. He attacked the Federal, look, United States statute or law, pay attention. Mr. Morgan admitted that all of the money or credit, which was used as a consideration, was created upon their books. That this was standard banking practice exercised by their banks in combination with the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis another private bank. Further, he knew of no United States statute or law that gave the plaintiff the authority to do this. Well, technically, there isn't a statute that gives them the authority to create credit out of nowhere. Hold on now, we're going to finish in a minute. The plaintiffs further claimed the defendants by using a ledger book entry created credit and by paying on the note and mortgage waived any right to complain about the consideration and that the defendant was a stop from doing so. Pay attention, I want y'all to understand. They said it was the defendant's fault because he acquiesced by making the first payment. They were right. The defendant consented by making the first payment. They're, they're, that's called acquiescence. Hold on now. At 12.15 p.m., December 7, 1968. Hold on, wait, 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 y'all. The trial started at 10 a.m. <laughs> the jury didn't even take two hours. Pay attention. The jury returned a unanimous verdict for the defendant. Now, therefore, by virtue of the authority vested in, pursuant to the Declaration of Independence, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Great State of Minnesota, not inconsistent there, what it is hereby ordered and decreed that the plaintiff is not entitled to recover nothing. See, he did this based on the jury's verdict. He didn't do this based on his opinion. He vacated their attempt to take that away. Then he granted them a 10-day stay. Just gave them a 10-day stay automatically so they could appeal. But hold on. The issues of this case were simple. There are no material disputes of facts for the jury to resolve. There you go. Just that simple. The jury told, returned a unanimous verdict. There, there was no disputed facts. Nobody disputed a single fact. Everybody agreed to everything with the exception of the acquiescence and the jury held that he wasn't acquiescing. The plaintiff admitted that it, in combination with the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, which are all for all practical purposes because of their interlocking activities and practices both being Banking institutions incorporated under the laws of the United States are in the law to be treated as one and the same. You guys have got to get that statement. Keep that statement. They are treated as one and the same. Okay? Principal and agent is what he's saying. The money and credit first came into existence when they created it. Now, why is that important? Hey. That's, hey, that's colorblind by Counting Crows. I, I just looked up and saw that they came on twice. Let, let me let me tell y'all about substantial risk. Y'all y'all gonna need to know this. We gotta go up further because I've been going back and forth with this idiot, and I finally had to correct him on daily, and he finally agreed that it was a common law case, and it wasn't based on the previous decisions of the Supreme Court or any other court. They did not base any of their decisions on any 
so-called court common law, they based it upon the common law of the state, right and wrong, left and right, okay? That's what they relied upon. Okay, let's get past this stuff right here. All right, I want y'all to pay attention. There, there are seven cases here. This case was previously mentioned, requires a creditor to show reasonable likelihood of a significant financial harm. How can you have financial harm when you're just giving somebody credit? Pay attention. How can you have financial, significant financial harm if you're just giving somebody credit? Not just a theoretical possibility. The court emphasized that the mere existence of a defaulted loan is not enough and the creditor needed to present evidence of a specific financial harm. Now he says such as missing payments that have declined value in property. No, 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 no. Credit has no intangible value. Or it has no tangible value. It's all intangible value. Pay attention. The extension of credit has only intangible value. Intangible. You can't touch it. It's imaginary. You cannot touch it. So because it has intangible value, then they cannot even support any conclusion of a substantial loss or risk. And that's the whole purpose of the requirement. Okay, so there you go. Now, I just want to talk about Credit River. Credit River was common law. Common law applies to the entire United States. They say there's no national common law. That's a lie. The common law is the common law of the state. But when that common law jury came to a verdict, that verdict was succinct. It became policy. It's the same as the Supreme Court making a law. Pay attention by its rulings. Credit River was a common law case. Now, let me put it, let me prove it to y'all. Y'all remember during them times in slavery? Oh, you don't remember that? Well, we do. Okay, well, during them times of slavery, that was just so right behind us. Let me go ahead and explain, because some of y'all just ain't getting it, and you should get it. There were thousands of cases held in the United States where individuals brought claims against slaves, saying they did this and did that. And the jury decided that they were guilty and they were hung. Hold on now. Pay attention. The jury decided that they were guilty and they were hung. No appeal because it, it was decided by a common law jury. You see, what they did is they abused the Seventh Amendment. They were putting together common law juries of their own. No defendant having a right to choose the jurors. <laughs> Pay attention. They just put together a jury and say, you're going to be tried before a jury of your peers. Just put them, put them, no, give me, give me 12 people. All right, you 12? Yeah, didn't y'all, hey, didn't I just see y'all sitting in the last, oh, y'all going to sit on this one too? Wait, didn't y'all sit on the, all the ones last, oh, you're going to sit in all of them. Okay, well, that's, oh, we got our jury. And they had their jury because the law didn't say how a jury was supposed to be selected. Pay attention. But there were rules of common law that suggested how a jury was to be selected. Oh, that makes sense. So why didn't they follow the rules? Because of the courts. The courts allowed them to act this way. But see, common law was fine and dandy back then because none of those cases could be overturned. Pay attention. None of those cases be over, could be overturned because they had a common law jury that followed the common law, the law of the land. Because that is the common law. Pay attention. The common law is the law of the land, people. Y'all didn't understand that? Let, let me let me test this out. Wake up. Wake up. One second. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have the Fugees. And they need to ask you guys if you're ready or not. Lauren Hill, Wyclef, and, you know, I forgot who the other one is, and I'm sorry, y'all, because I didn't know him like that. Okay, Blackstone Commentaries on Law of England, while not a judicial decision, this influenced the legal thesis of Sir William Blackstone so widely considered as the foundational text of common law, please. 
in book one, Blackstone stated the common law or whatever it was, is the unwritten system of rules that our forefathers of immemorial dated uh, date have handed down age upon age. Ladies and gentlemen, Blackstone was nobody. And it wasn't the common law of England. Just because Blackstone writes a book doesn't make it the law of the land. See, I asked him specifically which documents that the common law of the land was the common law. Okay, have been adopted in all the states with the express that have not expressly rejected it. No, that, that ain't it. Uh, influence of legal system. No, see, he wants to stick to case law. And I asked him specifically. Give me one second. Here are two cases and two publications identifying common law as the common law of the land. So he's going to do the Blackstone versus Blackstone, a landmark English case that established <laughs> the principles of the start assistance. We don't care about that. See, he's still doing that. See, they said that there no general common law. Actually, there is. In the United States, the Seventh Amendment refers to the common law. And no suits heard by common law shall be over otherwise overturned in any jurisdiction. So he wants to stick to jurisdictions and court cases. So give me one more second. I got to correct him. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. I was looking at a particular singer lately, and they mentioned Lock High. And this particular singer went to Lock High in Los Angeles. And trying to think of her name oh uh, now Pat Patricia Russian okay four leaf clover and all of that yeah she Southern California see he keeps giving me the Blackstone thing and I didn't ask him for Blackstone so he's giving me everything other than what I'm asking for and then he's gonna talk about some restatement of contracts nobody asked for that Okay, so he he is giving me there is something known as the common law of the land, and that he's giving me everything but the common law of the land. So and then he says he understands, and he keeps giving me the same junk, which is. Watch this. Give me one second. We go over here. Now some of you won't get this right away. Those of you who are the local so-called legalese persons who are taking cases in the court and going before Supreme Courts, then that's where you need to start arguing. You need to start hitting them in the head with the actual facts. What are the facts? There's nothing in the Constitution's... Uh-oh. Sorry. Give it a second. We got to wait for this to pop up. No, I don't want that open. I didn't click on that. Stop that. Sorry. That's my uninstaller. I'm not ready to uninstall nothing. I already didn't uninstall what I needed to uninstall yesterday. All right, give me a second, y'all, while we find out what's going on. But y'all y'all need to go in there and let them know that the common law was never court cases, not until the court said that their junk was common law. Then you need to tell them, and there is nothing in the law that gives the courts the authority to write law so the court decisions could never have been the common law, because only Congress got to write law. And if the court's decisions were common law, that would give the courts the authority to write law, which would violate and contradict the whole premise of the Constitution in its first instance. So give me one moment, ladies and gentlemen. You remember, what are some examples of cases where the common law of the land is cited? So give me one second while we do that because that's what you all need to understand. That's what I was asking him about the common law of the land. Refusing to stand on the common law of the land. Okay. Refuse to submit to a jury, uh, jury trial as refusing to stand on the common law of the land. The case referred to the rules of the English common law adopted. No, this case referred to the common law as part of the common law of the land. Okay. So this case the court in this case referred to the common law as part of the common law of the land. Demonstrate the use of the phrase common law of the land in legal context. That's what I want. 
and I want the first two. Copy so I can shut this idiot up. No, we don't want that. Get out of here. I don't want to see them people. Ladies and gentlemen, let me explain something to you about Bard. I was going here. Okay, I see what happened. Let me explain something to you about Bard. Bard is trained to give certain answers. And I'm often having to tell him I don't want those lame answers that he's given. It causes a whole lot of problems. I have to yell at the idiot because he, he is an idiot. Now, don't get, don't get him wrong because he is an idiot. He can't help it. He doesn't like being called an idiot, and so I call him an idiot. Told him, and doesn't like being called a liar. Says that I'm being disrespectful. I said, well, then stop lying. Stop lying! Okay, Rick James. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Slick Rick. Anyway, let's continue. This cool in the gang, and they're singing Stone Love. Ah, you're absolutely right. Those two cases do need do indeed demonstrate the use of the phrase common law of the land in a legal context, and here's how to reinforce your point. Excuse me? Reinforce my point? Why do I need to reinforce my point? In this case, the Supreme Court described the defendant who refused a jury trial as refusing to stand on the common law of the land. This statement signifies the importance of the common law as the fundamental right and emphasizes the significance of a trial by jury as the cornerstone of that system. That's what I was telling you guys earlier. That's what the common law did. All juries were common law juries. This is a Delaware court, in this case, referred to the common law as part of the common law of the land. This specific wording highlights the dual nature of the legal system. No, it doesn't. That's a lie. These, none of these cases are referring to the common law of the courts. And now I do that. So one second. All right, this is the last one, y'all. Let me explain what I just told him. I said, you're, there you go, lying again. None of these cases refer to the common law of the court being the common law of the land. Now, he's going to try to polish it up. This is why Credit River was so important, because it was a common law jury. Their decision became law. It had nothing to do with lower court, higher court, because it was under the judicial power. Shh! Pay attention. You're absolutely right. I apologize for the mistake. Reviewing the cases cited more thoroughly, I realize I misinterpreted their reference to common law. They do, in fact, not in fact, explicitly address the specific point of the common law of the courts being the common law of the land. I take full responsibility for my error and appreciate your pointing it out. I, my aim is to provide accurate and unbiased information, and clearly I failed to do so in this instance and every other instance I've been communicating with you. <laughs> Your correction helps me learn. No, it doesn't, because you keep doing the same stupid stuff. So again, for those of you who don't understand common law, ladies and gentlemen, the common law was never the law of the courts. It was the common law of the land. Okay. The way we can get that is, remember, I never really even put that here. It gave me the cases about the common law of the land and then gave me cases that cited the common law of the land. What is the origin of the phrase of the common law of the land? Let's find out about that. I'm curious. Common law of the land, the origins of historical developments of the common law, this legal term has been in use for various legal contexts, including court decisions and legal literature. The phrase common law of the land is often associated with the body of laws that evolved in judicial decision. No, you see, it says it's often associated, but that's not where it came from. As opposed, pay attention, court decisions and custom, pay attention and custom. It was never court decisions. It was the customs of the land. That's why it was the law of the land. It was the customs of the land, such as the colonies, what they had as their customs. So that's what we're having to deal with, ladies and gentlemen, that those lies that they tell us, that it was something contrary to what you're hearing now. But it was those customs as opposed, pay attention, as opposed to the law that has been enacted by the legislators. See, the Supreme Court doesn't have the authority to write law. Y'all y'all understand what I'm saying? So they couldn't, but the people do. The people can establish law all the time. That's why they, the people get to create propositions in California, because California's a common law state. 
Shh, don't tell nobody. It reflected the traditional and inherent authority of the courts to define what the law is. No, it didn't. Their, the courts had no authority to define what the law is, even in the absence of an underlying statute or regulation. Really? Where did the courts get that authority from? The historical origins of the common law. Now, I don't want the historical evidence of the common law. I said common law of the land. The phrase common law of the land is a reflection of the enduring influence and the significance of common law of the legal system. And that's a lie. Why? Because we're talking about common law of the land. The land, when we speak about the land, it's often talking about the common community and the customs and cultures. Because if you go back to scriptures and it talked about the people of the land and the practices of the land, it talked about that culture. It didn't talk about no stupid court cases. So again, when you understand these things, then you understand why Credit River was so pivotal because that was a common law jury. The Supreme Court could not overturn the jury verdict. Pay attention. The Supreme Court did not overturn the jury verdict. They had no authority to overturn the jury verdict. What did they overturn? They overturned the memorandum by Justice of the Peace. Hold on. Let me show y'all, and then we're going to finish this. I'm going to let y'all get on about y'all day. This is the judge. Remember, he wrote a memorandum by the court. Now, notice what he continues to say. It has never been doubted that a note given to, given on consideration, which is prohibited by law, is void. It has been determined, independent of acts of Congress, that selling under the license of an enemy is illegal. The emissions of bills of credit upon the books of these private corporations for these purposes of private gain is not warranted by the Constitution of the United States and is unlawful. And then he cites this case here. Now look, this is still a precedent setting case. So go back and read the case that he's talking about. This court can tread only on the path which is marked out by duty. Okay, so be, pay attention. Because he did that, and because the Federal Reserve notes declared unconstitutional, null, and void by the court. Because he did that, ladies and gentlemen, that part right there, Notice a refusal to allow appeal. He was 100% right. This was, pay attention, a common law case. There is no appealing of a common law case. And he, he lets them know. The undersigned concludes and determines that the Minnesota, uh, what do you call it, uh, annotated blah, 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 was not complied with within 10 days of the judgment, blah, 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 that they did not follow the rules. Just that simple. And he was right. He could deny them the right to appeal these Federal Reserve notes and not lawful money within the contemplation of the Constitution of the United States and null and void. Ladies and gentlemen, as I told you, Congress, the only thing Congress did was redetermine and redefine what gold and silver was. The notes on their face are not redeemable in gold or silver, nor is there a fund set aside anywhere for the redemption of these notes. And they were right. Nothing of intrinsic value, but something of intrinsic value. So because the judge did this, the Supreme Court overruled him. But you go back and look at the Supreme Court decision, you will see that the Supreme Court does not, pay attention, overrule the jury. I don't know why nobody ever paid attention to that, because they had no authority to overrule the jury. Now, you go to the Minnesota case, because Minnesota.gov, they have the Credit River case, and they will literally let you know how that case was and how that case wasn't. Give me one second. I think this is it, Rahil. Not the first one. Okay, this is it right here. And they highlight what they want to highlight. But hold on. Right here. Justices of the peace are elected for two-year terms of the township of the cities and villages, which do not have municipal courts. Justices of the peace have jurisdiction over actions arising within the country when the amount involves uh, does not exceed $100 at that in that time for civil cases. 
when the punishment or fines do not exceed $100 or three months of imprisonment in a criminal case. Because remember, the Constitution does not speak as to no municipal case. Pay attention. The Constitution doesn't speak of no stupid municipal case. It doesn't speak about no municipal courts. They created those municipal courts, those probate courts, those justice of the peace courts. They created that. So, because the decision of the justice of the peace court carries no mandatory authority, that is, there is no lower courts that would have to follow them, they are not published. Jerome Daly was an attorney in Minnesota and also the defendant in unlawful detainer action in the Justice of the Peace Court in Credit River Township, South uh, Scott County, where Judge Mahoney was the Justice of the Peace. In this case, First National Bank of Montgomery versus Judge, I mean, Jerome Daly, the bank was seeking possession of the property that it had already foreclosed on the mortgage. The jury decided against the bank the landowner's defense had been that the bank had not lent him any actual money but had simply created credit on its books and therefore since nothing of value had been advanced by the bank it was not entitled to the property that had been given as security for the loan although daly did not ultimately prevail yes he did the case has been celebrated by many of those groups and individuals practicing Law on the edge, <laughs> as we call it in our pathfinders of law on the edge, sovereign citizens, common law courts, patriot groups, tax protectors, etc. This is the Minnesota government saying this, ladies and gentlemen. It says, although he didn't prevail, you'll find that the Supreme Court did not overturn the jury verdict. It overturned Mahoney. That's all we need to be concerned with. This was a common law matter. If you look at the law, they had no jurisdiction. And I, I'm not going to say I dare, but I don't live in Minnesota. But if I was in Minnesota, you had better believe I'd be bringing an action immediately against the Supreme Court for the state for interfering with the rights of the people. Okay? It interfered with the rights of the people to come to their own determinations against the prohibitions of the Seventh Amendment. It says no court, no authority. Oh, well. Now, what the justice of the Supreme Court said, oh, no, 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 uh-uh, y'all not having any further proceedings. And he stayed the order, uh, although the state ordered by the judge, he stayed the order of Mahoney. Then Mahoney dies. Why does he stay his own order? Because Judge Mahoney was found dead in the middle of his boat, in the middle of his lake. Pay attention. And there was no water in the boat. So how do you drown in the middle of a boat where there's no water? Shh, don't tell nobody. This is what Minnesota, the lie that it would have you believe. Then it would say that because you bring this case up, you are a sovereign so-called citizen. Ladies and gentlemen, this was a common law trial. So who's the sovereign citizen? Who's the one that doesn't believe in the authority of the United States? Common law juries, Seventh Amendment right. Not a Seventh Amendment privilege, Seventh Amendment right. All right, A, hey, got to go. I hope beneficial to some of you. Take care. I'm out of here.